CVS 105 students, Dr. Shragi here. Welcome to the module that's about the carbon cycle. Now, to understand all about what's going on with regard to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we actually do need to spend a few minutes talking about the other constituents of the atmosphere, including other greenhouse gases besides uh, carbon dioxide. But um, in case you're unclear about this word constituent, I just pasted a little definition here. I like two different parts of that word, uh, to that, that definition there. Uh, on the first one there, that adjective definition one, being a part of the whole, like the constituent minerals in a rock, in it, that seems like a very good um, way of thinking about the word constituent. Under the noun definitions there, like part two, a component part of something, like the essential constituents of the human diet. I like this idea of it being a part of a whole. That's the way I want you to think about this word constituents. And if we were to look at a pie chart that shows the main constituents of the Earth's atmosphere, we can see that by far the single largest constituent of the Earth's atmosphere is diatomic nitrogen. Diatomic is just a fancy word for meaning it's two atoms hooked together to make a molecule. Uh, N2, diatomic nitrogen. Now, if you stick around for ATS 113 in another semester, you'll learn all about where diatomic nitrogen comes from and what it does in the atmosphere and so on. But that does not actually turn out to have any role whatsoever in the carbon cycle, so we don't need to get just too worried about diatomic nitrogen. For that matter, another 21% of the atmosphere is diatomic oxygen, O2, the kind of things that you and I need in order to live, and the kind of things that plants produce, and so on. Uh, diatomic nitrogen, oxygen is another, diatomic oxygen, O2, is another important gas that makes up about 21%. Only about 1% of the Earth's atmosphere isn't either nitrogen or oxygen. And in fact, of that remaining 1%, a big chunk of that is argon. Argon, A-R, is just a, uh, as another inert gas in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, nitrogen, oxygen, and argon all have the property of not being greenhouse gases. Okay? They have important roles that they play in the Earth's atmosphere, but none of those are actually part of the greenhouse effect, none of them are part of the carbon cycle, etc. What makes them not greenhouse gases is that they don't interact with long wave radiation. They don't absorb it, and, the, and well, they don't really very efficiently emit it either. They are not part of the processes of, that are maintaining the temperature of the Earth, at least not in this context. Now, the next most abundant gas in the Earth's atmosphere is water vapor. Water vapor is highly variable from one location to another, and from one time to another, and from one height to another. But it is, in fact, a key greenhouse gas in the Earth's atmosphere. Remember, we're going to be using this abbreviation GHG for greenhouse gas. Um, the total concentration at any given location in the Earth's atmosphere, um, your book uses the number 0 to 4 percent. 4 percent would certainly be a very, very humid condition. Maybe in a rainstorm in the jungle, you might have as much of the atmosphere as 4 percent. Uh, water vapor, but um, you know a much more common number would be like one percent or less, something like that. But the highly variable nature of water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere is why we go to so much effort and expense collecting observations of the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere, like in situ observations from the launching of weather balloons, like what you're seeing here, where we actually fly instruments into the atmosphere to measure the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere, or satellite images that are telling us about how much water vapor is in the atmosphere. Uh, this is not exactly an image, it's a product that the satellite can get based on the radiation that is being emitted and scattered and reflect, uh, not reflected, but uh, em emitted and scattered and absorbed and so on by water vapor in the atmosphere. We can determine where is there more and where is there less water vapor in the atmosphere. By mass, water vapor is actually our most abundant greenhouse gas in the Earth's atmosphere. How come you never hear about water vapor then when people are talking about climate change and greenhouse gases and so on? 
Well, it turns out human activity doesn't really add very much water vapor to the Earth's atmosphere. There is a certain amount of water vapor that comes out the tailpipe of your car from the combustion of fossil fuels and so on. But overall, human activity directly doesn't add very much water vapor. Now, we might be increasing the temperature of the planet, which might be increasing the rate of evaporation. We may have to get to that at some point. But directly, in terms of what we add to the atmosphere, overall it's very little. Now, if you take the diatomic nitrogen, plus the diatomic oxygen, plus the argon, plus the water vapor, at any given time in the Earth's atmosphere, we're talking about 99.95%. That means that there's not very much of anything left after those four gases right there. But those trace gases that do make up that final 0.05% on average, are, turn out to be absolutely essential to life on Earth. Let me just give you a definition here of this word trace gases. I got this particular definition from the American Meteorological Society's Glossary of Meteorology. Uh, it says that a trace gas is a chemical that is present in the atmosphere at a very low level, typically on the order of parts per million or less, which is usually due to either the fact that it's very chemically active, it's easy to remove it from the atmosphere, or because it is produced very slowly or whatever. Things like ozone and nitrogen and carbon monoxide are going to be the examples. But the one we're going to focus on first is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, CO2, one carbon atom, two oxygen atoms all hooked together. At the present time on Earth, the concentrations of carbon dioxide run right around 400 ppm, or parts per million. So if you had a million air molecules and you could somehow sort them out and count them, 400 of them would be carbon dioxide uh, atoms, I'm uh, sorry, carbon dioxide molecules. Um, that's not a lot, right? I mean, carbon dioxide is a trace gas. There just isn't that much of it out there. But it is a very strong greenhouse gas. We have been directly monitoring carbon dioxide concentrations in the Earth's atmosphere with in-situ pieces of equipment since the 1950s. Um, we can, of course, get paleo proxies and so on, like, you know, and fossil air in bubbles and ice cores and the kinds of things we've talked about earlier in the course. But if we want to just talk measurements, uh, in situ observations, we can only go back to the 1950s, and you get a chart that looks something like this that shows the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, I want to call your attention to the fact that on the y-axis here, it doesn't go all the way down to zero. Um, the, the axis only goes down to about 300 parts per million, but there's still quite an impressive trend there. Um, when we go back and look at um, the records of, from like air that is trapped in ice cores and stuff like that, we find that the pre-industrial concentrations of carbon dioxide we're about 280 parts per million, and we're around 400 parts per million now, which means that we have increased the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by about 50% since the Industrial Revolution. It makes for a pretty impressive trend. That trend, of course, is simply because of the, uh, the burning of fossil fuels. We're going to learn more about what happens when we burn fossil fuels and so on, but a big part of what comes out of the smokestack or what comes out of the tailpipe of a car or whatever is carbon dioxide. And so we are adding carbon dioxide to the Earth's atmosphere, and it is increasing the total amount of carbon dioxide. Now, you'll also notice if you look closely that there's a lot of wiggling around that trend line, and with that little red dots and so on, and in fact, there's a very strong annual cycle to carbon dioxide, too, which is what that little inset diagram there is trying to show you here. That is associated purely with natural sources and sinks of carbon dioxide. Sources, processes that add carbon dioxide to the Earth's atmosphere, and sinks processes that remove carbon dioxide from the at Earth's atmosphere. If you look from like maybe May to about October, you can see that the amount of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere is going down. Now, at first glance, what we could say about that, and again, we'll talk more about that in the carbon cycle section uh, lecture next, but um, we could say that in the warm season, plants are consuming carbon dioxide as part of photosynthesis. Remember, plants remove carbon dioxide from the Earth's atmosphere as part of how they use sunlight to make food. And so, during the time of year when plants are active, they are extracting carbon dioxide from the Earth's atmosphere, and the amount of carbon dioxide goes down for six months. On the other hand, in the cold season, when plants are dormant, uh, but respiration is still going on, animals and bacteria are still consuming food and consuming, using oxygen to get energy and so on, and we release carbon dioxide back into the environment, we are releasing carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere faster than it is being consumed by plants and carbon dioxide levels rise. All of which makes good sense until you think about the fact that what is this business of the cold season and the warm season? We're talking globally. If it's the warm season in the northern hemisphere, it's the cold season in the southern hemisphere. 
If plants are active in the northern hemisphere, plants are dormant in the southern hemisphere, you'd think it would cancel out. But it doesn't actually cancel out. If you take a look at a map of the world, uh, with vegetation in some sense on here in the sense of green or whatever, and I've got the equator drawn in there, the first thing you'll notice is there's a whole lot more land in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere, and plants live on land. Secondly, a lot of the land that's in the southern hemisphere is Antarctica, where there's no plants. Worldwide, there's far more plant material in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. So, summer in the northern hemisphere dominates versus summer in the southern hemisphere. In the northern hemisphere, during the summer, plants, there's so many more plants, they are consuming enormous amounts of carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide globally goes down. In the southern hemisphere, winter, there just aren't, uh, summer, there just aren't that many plants. They aren't consuming that much carbon dioxide globally, and so what's happening in the northern hemisphere dominates. If you just focus on the amounts of these gases that are being emitted by humans, that is to say the anthropogenic sources, not necessarily as in like what we're breathing out, I mean like as in human processes like industry and so on, the EPA's website has some figures as to what are the sources of uh, carbon dioxide em emissions. And the single largest source, according to the EPA, is electricity production. Um, Coal-fired power plants, principally, natural gas power plants, etc. Um, I think if you... I think the book gives uh, a similar number. I don't expect you to memorize these percentages, but knowing which is the biggest source of um, anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions would be a good idea. Uh, mobile sources like uh, transportation, you know, like cars and trains and trucks and stuff, are the next biggest. And then you can see things like industry and, and residential and, com and commercial buildings and so on make up chunks too. Now, our next constituent of the atmosphere that is also a strong greenhouse gas is methane. The chemical symbol for methane is CH4. It's one carbon atom hooked to four hydrogen atoms. Um, methane is what we call natural gas. Okay, if you have natural gas, if you have a gas stove, if you have gas heat in your home, you have a gas hot water heater, whatever. Uh, that natural gas is methane. We extract it from the ground. It is trapped in layers of shale deposits and so on in the ground, and there are ways that we can extract it from them to make it a commercially usable product. At the present time in the Earth's atmosphere, the concentrations of, carbon, of methane in the atmosphere are about 1.8 parts per million. That is a very, very small number. In fact, on this chart that I'm going to give you from the IPCC report, uh, they actually switched to using PPB, or parts per billion for their units of methane. And so in that case, then we're currently sitting at about 1,800 parts per billion of methane in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, again, we've been measuring methane concentrations in the atmosphere since the 1950s. Uh, if you go back to air trapped in ice cores and things like that, we can find out that the pre-industrial levels of methane in the Earth's atmosphere were 722 parts per billion. In other words, human activity has more than doubled the amount of methane in the Earth's atmosphere. And since methane is a powerful greenhouse gas, we have a serious issue. Methane, per molecule, methane is much more effective than carbon dioxide. There's, there's a thousand times more carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere, but, it is, but per molecule, methane actually is, has, a better, has a stronger effect. It, has a, it is more effective at absorbing long-wave radiation. Uh, what are the, the anthropogenic sources of methane? Methane doesn't have a huge cycle in, in the natural world in the sense of like an annual cycle and so on. Um, the, the anthropogenic sources, though, the primary one is horrifying. It's the natural gas and petroleum system. Um, we actually had a class on this uh, a couple semesters ago at Creighton that was about uh, the natural gas pipeline system and so on, and I was one of the teachers of that class, and I was shocked to discover just how much natural gas leaks. Um, it is a tricky thing to distribute gas through pipelines. It's a tricky thing to extract gas from wells and so on, and the system is full of leaks, and natural gas is cheap enough per cubic foot uh, that they don't worry about that. If gas gets out, it gets out. We'll just, you know, sell the stuff that makes it through. So nearly a third of all the methane emissions in the Earth's atmosphere is just nothing more than leaks in the natural gas distribution system. Um, the next biggest source was is listed there as enteric fermentation. I had to actually look up that word enteric. Enteric just means, like, indigestive tracts. Um... Most meteorology and climatology textbooks then proceed to get a little bit clever with you and tell you that this is about cattle flatulence. In other words, cow farts. And that certainly is a big part of it. In other words, the relatively unhealthy diet of cattle in a high-density feed yard, they get 
a great deal of gas production, and so cattle flatulence is a major source of enteric fermentation as a source of methane in the Earth's atmosphere. It turns out, actually, this is a lot of different kinds of fermentation that leads to the release of natural gas in the atmosphere. Um, termites, for example, produce a horrifying amount of methane in their digestive system. Um, the bacteria and so on that live in rice paddies, where they grow rice, um, rice paddies are gorgeous and they make lovely pictures and so on, but they're actually a very unhealthy ecosystem, and the system produces enormous amounts of methane. Uh, those are all making up about a quarter of the total anthropogenic emissions of, of methane. And then landfills. You might know that many landfills nowadays actually try to capture their methane because they're releasing a lot of methane, which is a saleable product. We can actually, you know, the, the landfill can actually capture the methane that is being produced as the trash decomposes and actually sell that on the open market. Manure management and coal mining actually release a surprising amount as well. Manure management is like a, on a modern industrial farm, how they deal with the, with the manure on the farm, like manure lagoons and things like that, which are not pleasant to think about. Um, another important greenhouse gas in the Earth's atmosphere that is also a trace gas is nitrous oxide, N2O, two nitrogens bound to one oxygen atom. Uh, this is what your dentist calls laughing gas. I mean, if you go to see your dentist, she will give you laughing gas if you're a difficult patient and she's scared you're going to move or whatever. Uh, it occurs at fairly small concentrations in the Earth's atmosphere, 0.3 parts per million or 300 parts per billion in the Earth's atmosphere, and it is an extremely strong greenhouse gas. Um, if we turn to the IPCC report again, they track what they think uh, the, the well, what observations of greenhouse of nitrous oxide in the atmosphere since the 1950s are, as well as projections of future uh, emissions of carbon, uh, sorry, of nitrogen, of nitrous oxide rather. Um, we can tell from things like ice trapped, uh, air trapped in ice cores that pre-industrial values of nitrous oxide are somewhere around 270 parts per billion. So we've increased the total amount of nitrous oxide in the Earth's atmosphere by about 10%, which certainly is not the end of the world. It, it is, in fact, though, pretty much entirely from one key source, um, which the EPA live, level um, describes rather as agricultural soil management. That's another way of saying artificial fertilizers. Um, artificial fertilizers typically one of the things they're doing is enriching the nitrogen content of the soil, but a lot of that nitrous nitrogen is in the form of nitrous or in terms of ammonia that then become nitrous oxide in the air's atmosphere. Uh, the other kinds of sources, um, there are some uh, emissions of nitrous oxide from things like uh, power plants and chemical production facilities and so on. Then we hit two constituents of the Earth's atmosphere that get a little bit confusing because they confuse two issues. We're first going to talk about the halocarbons, which have great names like chlorofluorocarbons and hydrochlorofluorocarbons. Better word would be CFCs for chlorofluorocarbons and HCFCs for hydrochlorofluorocarbons. Uh, these are extremely powerful greenhouse gases, but they incur in very, very low concentrations in the Earth's atmosphere, uh, particles per trillion, parts per trillion typically. Um, there is no natural source of chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, and HCFCs in the Earth's atmosphere. All halocarbons are, are uh, man-made. They are incredibly useful materials that are in fire suppression systems like um, fire extinguishers. They are blowing agents in the manufacture of styrofoam. They are uh, propellants for certain kinds of... Uh, uh, aerosol cans, they are, or at least were. Um, the biggest use of them, of course, is as refrigerants. You might know about things like Freon and so on. Those are all chlorofluorocarbons. Um, they are darn useful materials, but when they escape into the atmosphere, they are extremely powerful greenhouse gases. It's complicated, though, because the, especially the chlorofluorocarbons, the CFCs, are also the main story about the depletion of the ozone layer. Now, this class is specifically about climate change. I want to steer as much as possible away from ozone depletion, which is a very important problem too, but is not directly related to climate change. So yes, it, the main reason actually we were working on, well, most chlorofluorocarbons themselves have actually been phased out, but other halocarbons like HCFCs and so on have not yet been. The main reason we worry about them is because of their depletion of the ozone layer, which is necessary for life on Earth. The ozone layer absorbs almost all the ultraviolet radiation from the sun, and ultraviolet radiation from the sun is a type of shortwave radiation, and it's dangerous to DNA and your cells and so on, but that is completely separate from these gases' role as a greenhouse gas in the Earth's atmosphere. 
And since we're talking about ozone, let's throw ozone in here. Ozone is O3. It is three atoms of oxygen hooked together. That's in contrast to the kind of oxygen you and I breathe, which is O2, diatomic oxygen. Ozone's primary exciting thing about it is that it absorbs all the ultraviolet radiation. Life would not be possible on the Earth if there wasn't ozone up there absorbing the ultraviolet radiation from the sun. But as it happens, ozone is also a greenhouse gas. It is also contributing to the warming of the surface of the Earth. Ozone is nasty stuff. It's a gas. You, can, you could produce it in a chemistry lab and so on. It's toxic. It kind of burns in your nose. It triggers asthma. It's, it's, a, it's a nasty, smelly stuff. Old photocopiers used to give it off as a part of the um, production of the laser that did the copying. Um, as it happens, there's kind of two different places where ozone is in the Earth's atmosphere. Most of the natural ozone in the Earth's atmosphere is happening way up high, about 25 kilometers up in what we call the ozone layer. But there's also a lot of ozone that comes from human activity, anthropogenic ozone, which is near the surface. And I just happened to find online this particular diagram that shows on the x-axis ozone concentration. Don't worry about the units, this is kind of technical. And then with respect to height on the y-axis. And so like you can see somewhere around 25 to 30 kilometers up on that particular day, this was actually an aircraft that penetrated the ozone layer and measured it with in situ observations. And we can see that there's a lot of ozone up at about 25, 30 kilometers up. That's good ozone that is absorbing ultraviolet radiation and protecting the life on the Earth from those damaging rays from the sun. Now, down near the surface of the Earth, in this case at about three kilometers, you see this big spike in the amount of bad ozone. It's not that they're about the amount of ozone, which turns out to be pollutant. It's toxic. It triggers asthma. It's part of photochemical smog, things like that. Um, it isn't that it went down to zero near the height. The, the, this particular report was very clear about that. Um, the, the instruments on that particular aircraft didn't turn on until they hit about three kilometers above the ground. The amount of ozone would get bigger and bigger as you got closer to the ground just because of the anthropogenic sources of ozone. That ozone has no reason to be there. That is, there's no nat Well, that's not entirely true. Lightning strikes produce a small amount of ozone and so on. But almost all ozone near the surface of the Earth is bad ozone. It's, it's not doing any good for, the, for, uh, for stopping ultraviolet radiation and it's enhancing the greenhouse effect and it's a health hazard. Okay, so that's just sort of a brief survey of the different constituents of the Earth's atmosphere before we dive into thinking all about all the different uh, ways in which we are moving carbon in and out of the Earth's atmosphere. Let me wrap this lecture up, actually, with a couple of quick questions. Question one, which of the following is not a greenhouse gas? Water vapor, argon, methane, ozone. Click on one of the four options below this video to get a little feedback before you move on to question two.